Wow. It's uh, bigger than it had appeared. Um, Mr. Paul Williams. Um, thanks to everybody for coming. It's um, absolutely brilliant to see so many of you here. Um, the format for the lecture series is pretty much always the same. Uh, Paul and I will chat for about 50, 55 minutes, um, just about life, the universe and everything. And then we'll be handing it over to yourselves. Um, so those of you who I have discussed asking questions, just make sure when that comes around to give me a good wave so I know where you are. Because um, all I can see is just a sea of faces just at the moment. So just make yourself known to me. So uh, that's pretty much how it'll run. I, as usual, guarantee to have you out of here by half past three. Okay, so you needn't worry about buses or anything like that. So sit comfortably. Uh, Paul, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, These people must be getting free lectures or something. Are they getting off for the afternoon? Or there something? Well, yeah, they're off, off for the afternoon to be here. Yeah. The next hour <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> full, full marks for that one. Um, Paul, why the fascination with crime? What is it that seems to fascinate us with the whole area of, for want of a better word, sort of illegal and antisocial behavior? I think it's because um, <clears throat> in, everybody we, in, in everybody there are still the level of norms. You know, social norms, you're, you're educated or your system of knowledge that you grow up and tell you you can do this and you can't do that, and there are rules and regulations. And I think one of the reasons why people are fascinated by crime is that, like, I, I tried to explain this when I was doing, and I did it from a criminological point of view when I was doing the general, is that people liked and were fascinated by the, gen by the general, for example, back in the uh, 87, 88, when he came on and hit the TV first. <clears throat> and the reason they were, because he was a mystical character, not mystical, no, he was um, an intriguing character who went around with, base, or with, with uh, uh, balaclavas on his head, or if, or if he was stuck for balaclavas, he got his Mickey Mouse shorts and put them over his head. And um, <clears throat> people were fascinated because they wanted to know what he looked like. But also they were fascinated by the catalogue of crime. But as I made the point when I did the general, uh, that it was also in, for people, they were able to point. I think uh, I'd use it. Uh, a quote from Carl Jung on a number of occasions, which has just gone totally out of my head now, which goes to show what kind of a scholar I am. But, um, but basically what it suggests that, you know, it, it, people get a sense of reassurance, validation, or whatever, when they can be able to point the finger and say, there's a bad man there. He's a bad man. He's badder than I am. Mm. I think there's a degree of that. In the, there's also an ambivalence in human beings in that <clears throat> how many of us have watched movies and get a guilty pleasure of seeing the bad guys getting away with the robbery or getting away with the crime. It's, it's just the way we are. The reason I think society has rules and regulations is because people would break them, you know, and the, that's what we're like. I got caught breaking the law coming down here today, you know. It pissed me off I got caught. I was enjoying breaking it before I got caught, you know, because it was driving me on a hundred mile an hour. Like, these things happen, you know. <laughs> so do you think we live vicariously in a way th through these criminal figures? Well, I don't know. I think, you see, the whole focus of society and where we are now and our, and our whole system of knowledge is changing again. Because all it, our whole attitude to life and our whole disposition has changed because now people feel guilty to have an 11D car. You know the way we were a few years ago? I own half of such a village. Uh, everybody was what they owned and what they had. And we got a bit daft. And I always compared that Celtic Tiger thing to a cocaine party. You know, everyone out with a tree think it's going to be great fun and what a hangover afterwards but um, we have become in a way <coughs> desensitized to crime well we have been de desensitized to crime because of the developments over the past 10 years or 12 years particularly with the Celtic Tiger but also people are preoccupied now with their basic day-to-day -day existence the problem we have is that the new book I've done with it which is about and I know you're probably going to mention it to me after so I'll probably jump the gun but in the past four decades I took about the history of organized crime in Ireland where it's come from or where it's going to. Um, and in the 80s and the 70s, the reason why organized crime, as I said, the, the, the Duns and the Cahals and all these guys were the shadow of the shadow of the gunmen, uh, which was the IRA and the INLA, they were actually thriving because the state was totally preoccupied with its own existence, as in um, uh, you know, the fact that there was a serious subversive threat to the stability of the existence of the state. 
So when, while all that was going on, organised crime as we know it was allowed to take root and develop. And also then we had serious sociological problems like were put, given, uh, given uh, voice or given expression through the, uh, the explosion in heroin abuse in Dublin, <coughs> which happened in the space of a couple of months. And probably faster there than anywhere else in Europe. <coughs> we're doing that again. Uh, crime and criminality. If I was doing a new section of my book in 10 years' time, I would call it the post- Celtic Tiger stroke EU IMF bailout fuck up uh, because you know you're going to have a situation where over the next 10 years we're going to give we're giving birth to a whole new era and type of organized crime uh, like anyone here like everybody knows people who have been burgled and robbed at the moment that's happening on a massive scale the police are being under resourced and cut back to an extraordinary level that has never been seen before in the state why because we just don't have the money anymore uh, and I think as well, social programs, things that actually might be able to save, like, if, you know, I know you're a social worker. But if you have a, if a social worker knows that he's done a good job, if you save one kid in maybe 200, would I be right? Sure, yeah. yeah. So those kind of programs that were there are now going and gone. So what we're doing is we're leaving the doors wide open again. We're just, because we're just totally preoccupied. No, we're probably getting off the point. But, uh, no, no, it's a fair point. The, we, have, we are throwing the baby out with the bath water. You do have to have a level of social control. Always, you must always have that. Um, but I think we've been totally distracted, and we would pay the price in another age. An awful lot of the, the, the students that are here today are, are, are wanting to go out and work as, as a social care workers, working with young people, kids, teenagers. What is it that attracts a young person who maybe comes from, to all intents and purposes, a good family, you know, has all of the positive influences of school, <coughs> What is it that would attract them to go into a criminal lifestyle or, or get sucked into one of these gangs? How does that process begin? It happens on several different levels. Uh, and no, there is a stereotypical sort of quintessential theory how it happens. Talking about the kids from good homes, not the kids who were born to, like, Wayne Dundon's kids, you know what I mean? You can write his uh, thesis for him now, you know, but when they're only one and two, one of them, one of his lucky, lucky babies was born a few months ago. What a life he's going to have. Um, but there's a predictability in that. Yes. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, I would say a lot of kids I've come across through the years <coughs> who come from good homes. Uh, and this is why at the moment, uh, it, there is always an environment favourable to attracting kids. Because, you know, but at the moment, the current climate, in so-called working class estates, where there's high unemployment, uh, people are very hard pressed. And I tried to make the point the other night in the Late Late Show that in the current climate we're living in that you have people, the middle classes and the working classes, the people who are, have to carry the can. They're getting screwed from the top by government and economics and taxes. And they're getting screwed from below by the underworld in the, in the estates where they live because there's lawlessness. Uh, you see young kids who, mammy and daddy don't have any money. Uh, they're trying their best. They see a guy down the road in the shiny tracksuit driving a belt or a little car, one of those noisy little things. That little <laughs> shit, every time you see them, those <laughs> we, racer cars. we know the ones you're talking or about. Or they're driving a five series BMW and they have loads of money. And a lot of these guys, I, comp I equate them to be like paedophiles because they will, young kids in that scenario are very insecure. They're lacking self esteem. I'm not talking about criminals, I'm talking about the kid growing up yeah. with mommy and daddy and he sees there's probably conflict in home, inevitable conflict in home because of the, 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 the problems that they're facing. The poverty, yeah. <clears throat> and this, I'm, I'm only giving you this probably elongated, you probably put everybody asleep, but it, it, this is the, the, the one I've seen, scenario I've seen most often. Uh, he will see that this guy, in your 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, very impressionable, this guy who's 17, 18, 19, 20, the cops are always in at him, he's the bad boy. Parents are saying, don't go near him. Don't go to him. Don't be seen talking to him. You see kids hanging around him. He looks after the kids, gives them a few pounds. And uh, the kid finds himself getting mixed up with him. And he give the, the kid, tell the kid he's cool. You're cool. You're good. You'll be in our gang. We look, and this, the movies, like the, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. Like, you know, the, this is the real world. You see it in the movies all the time. But it, 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 that, that's what, because it is what it is. But they will go along and say, right, you, you're, you're a good kid. Listen, when you moved out there for me, and we'll give them money. And suddenly they would have money. And they will learn the values of a different scenario. And it's very, very easy. It's a, it's a very, very, very easy. You know the way they say your sanity, the, the fine line between sanity and insanity? Yes. I don't know which side I'm on. But, um, 
But, you know, that fine line, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's very easy. A kid is a very, very vulnerable and very um, uh, impressionable creature. And it's very easy. And I'll I tell you what really put it up in my mind. Well, I was down in Limerick uh, about two years ago. <clears throat> and obviously I've been in Limerick quite a bit through the years. And um, I have a lot of friends down there. And uh, we were l allowed out with a special squad had been sent down to literally, literally Harris the McCarthy Dundons. Now, I can talk about the McCarthy Dundons later if you want to, but they're, we call them Murder Incorporated. They are the most savage bunch of Neanderthals I've ever had the displeasure of knowing. But this young kid, there was a guy called Jimmy Collins, who was in something that attended quite a lot at the time, asking for a peace process to begin, because these guys all think they're Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams. And they've murdered as many people probably as well. And uh, they... Uh, it's talking about this peace process and the police in Dublin are down harassing us. But I remember this guy, Jimmy Collins, who was mouthing off a lot. And, you know, maybe he's right, I was thinking. Until I was out on, a, on patrol one day with these cops, we were doing a fly in the wall type thing. And they pulled in this kid who was about 13 years of age. And they took the mobile phone of him. And he was giving them loads of lip. Because these were the special boys down from Dublin. That they were wearing bulletproof vests and wearing balaclavas and everything. The cops were. Not the mm. just about. And... Uh, the, but I, I remember during the course of the conversation, we were saying, you know, who are you working for? We know you're running drugs. Who are you working for? And I was going to say, oh, fuck off, you old pulling pigs, I'll tell you no. But what was interesting was the mobile phone kept beeping when he was, when the cops were telling us. The cop looked at, he said, look, see this here. It was Jimmy Collins, the guy who was wanting to talk about the peace process. I'm bringing Limerick back down and there's no, there's no row between us and the Keynes and all this kind of stuff. But the message to the young lads, where are you, where are you, where are you? And what they want to know is, where are you? You're supposed to be delivering drugs. Where are you? And one of the thing, one of the text messages, you know, just the cop just showed me, said, look, Jimmy Collins says, move your fucking arse now and do what you're supposed to be doing or you'll get it or something like that. Uh, this kid had become their slave. And the cop just turned around. And it was one of those poignant moments. It puts it all in perspective. I'd love to have had it filmed. It. Mm. He said, you know, kid, you're 13. In five years' time, you're going to be dead because you're mixing with these bunch of savages. And all these guys do, they, they soak you in like, like pedophiles. They soak you in and they blow them out. Like, for example, Roy Collins, who was a friend of mine who was shot dead on Holy Thursday <coughs> three years ago, four years ago. Uh, and his dad is a very close friend of mine, Steve. Uh, the person who was convicted of shooting him was a young, impressionable buffoon as well who came from a good family. Yeah. Because he got soaked into it. And when you get sucked into it, then there is no going out. There's no leaving it again. It's like the ma mafia. Uh, and they took a young kid down in Limerick as well. Uh, his name is Cronin. He went on a job where they went to kill a fella called Maloney. He's about 18 years of age. And uh, he, all these kids think they've got bottle until it comes to somebody puts a gun in their hand. They say, right, shoot him. It's a big different story when you shoot somebody. And I've talked to a lot of guys who've shot people. Mm. Uh, and the young fella was only involved in, he, he actually didn't do the shooting, but he was there for the shooting, he procured the car, and was in the car at the time. He started falling apart afterwards. And even though his mother was living with a very, very heavy player called Anthony Kelly from out in Kilrush, who was a serious, serious player behind the McCarthy Dunn, so was involved in a lot of the stuff that went on in Limerick, they just turned around and said, we've had too many problems with all these young pups, we can't teach them. So they just turned around and said, we're going for a drive. They went down to a piece of ground, open ground, and they started digging a hole. What are we digging the hole for? We're going to bury some guns. And then they just turned on the shot twice in the head. And they buried him. And he was half buried. He didn't give a shit if anyone found him. He was like a dog. And he was found. And then another guy who was there at the time was starting to get very nervous about himself. Another young Understandably. Guy. And he ran to Roxborough Road, guard station. And it's an elongated way of answering your question. Like, they were all kids who were from good families. People who loved them. And this kid... Like, obviously, because it's a dirty business, the cops offered him a deal and said, right, we put you in the witness protection program. We can't guarantee you that you, you're going to not serve your life sentence, but will you give us evidence, give you evidence against the people who sent you out that day, the rest of the McCarthy Dundons? And he wouldn't. So he has, phys he has basically given away his life. He's only 21, 22 now, whatever. Uh, he gave away his life because he got mixed up with these guys. Is there a, a type of psychology kind of a psychological profile of the type of person that can survive under those circumstances, that can kind of go in and choose to make a career 
out of doing that? Is there a psychological type, do you but think? There is, like, Christy, the vast majority of them will always say, we were talking about this yesterday, you know, we live in a capitalist economic system. So our system of knowledge, how we live is, you know, you technically, everyone's egalitarian and you can, you can move up to the ranks of your social structure and go get an education, uh, you know, get your own space in life, find your place and have your own self-esteem, like everybody here. Everybody here has a place in their lives and they're, they're happy with who they are and what they are. And they're trying to get somewhere else uh, and they have their self-esteem. That's all very important and that's what every human being should have. Um, but, they will, they, uh, but they will explain to you that we're living in a, a world whereby, you know, Christy Dunn was, uh, I've gone into a lot of detail about this in my new book. Uh, Christy Dunn and his family were victims. And he was a victim from the start. Victims of what? No, no, he tell you he was a victim. Oh, right, okay. Uh, victims of the, the cruel capitalist <coughs> system. And all, a lot of gougers, or sorry, gougers, criminals, become socialists. Until such time as then they're starting to heap in the money from the drug trade and then everyone, fuck off, this is my money or I'll shoot you. So they're mm. more degree, they, make it, they make the Shawnee Fitzpatrick's look innocent, you know. <laughs> but um, they all have this, they will always say that they're victims, but they will also will say as well, they will rationalise their behaviour by turning around and saying to you, well, hang on a minute, and they're quite right in this. You know, the people who run this country are criminals. The people who ran the banks are criminals. The people who looked after the bankers are criminals. The developers and the, biz the business people are criminals and corrupt. So we are only... You're only getting at us because it's it's fashionable to say, well, there's the bad guy at the lower end of the level, at the le low, lower end of the ladder. So that's basic. That's the, the fundamental of a lot of their of the, how they think. Like Christy Kennehan uh, is a hugely well-educated guy. He's the one percent. Uh, he's very very well-educated, two or three degrees. In fact, he was offered uh, barely released from prison, temporary release uh, before he got full release for a, uh, a drug case he was involved in, Port Leash. And he, did, he turned it down because he wanted to finish his environmental science degree. But, you know, you've got to give him full marks for that. Mm. And now he's the big, one of the biggest drug traffickers in Europe. Uh, Putting his education to good use. Yeah, but, the, the, but the, then there's... A, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he did, you know what? Actually, that's funny you mention that as an aside. Part of his uh, money laundering activities was into renewable energy. <laughs> you know, you've got to hand it to this guy. A renew, like he, he could have qualified to be a member of the Green Party. And they wouldn't have said no to him because they would have got tools in that place anyway. They have, but anyway, sorry, don't get me going with that. Um, but the, 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 the harsh reality is as well though, that there's, it's, a, it's a pyramid type system, apart from the likes of Kenan and the very hierarchy. Um, and they would, like, there's a predictability, and I'll give you a story about how predictable it is. Uh, you had PJ Judge, who was a notorious, like he was, we call him the psycho, in fairness. Uh, I know a lot of people, academics, give out about calling people psychos and that, but this guy, you know, there was nothing else to call him. Mm. He was a truly crazy man. In fact, he could instill terror in people on, on, in a way that I've never seen before. And he, the reason I, I've such an inter I had such an interest in him was because he was going to murder me. or he was going to have, One of his plans was to have me abducted, raped, and then uh, videotaped and left back on the street and the tape to be distributed around Dublin. This was in 19, early 1996, before Veronica was murdered. Um, but the psycho was... And how did he let you know that, that, that well, he was we planning that? Because one of the fellows who was hired to do the job went and told the police. Okay. Who then, by the way, uh, was then caught and has got 15 years as an aside to tell you the kind of creatures you're dealing with. Right. He hired himself out to go in, for this man hired him to go in and rape his wife in the house. To terrorize the woman. Yeah, but, and that's another day's work. But anyway. Um, they, uh, so anyway, PJ Judge got into the drug trade and he, was, he had a, a certain way of doing business. And I went after him because he, he kidnapped a guy I used to know called Jock Corbally and took him away. He's never been found. Tortured him to death. It's a famous story. I've made it famous through the years. Probably a lot of your audience here don't even remember this because I'm getting so bloody old. But anyway, <laughs> um, but anyway he, he put a contract out to, to do me at the time. Uh, but he was subsequently murdered himself. But the person he had, his protege was a guy called Martin Marlow Highland. And Marlow sister was living with judge and a judge was also bisexual as well which was part of the convoluted sort of uh, the psychology of the man uh, because he had a, he, had a, he was a very strange individual he had a, uh, and a lot of it does at the run the, at the basis of it a lot of it's our sexuality as well but anyway, um, but anyway Marlow Highland with in conjunction with the provisional IRA decided to get rid of si judge because he was becoming an embarrassment because Veronica had been murdered in June and the police were going to move on to judge straight after because they knew they had to go after him and then they had the resources and the impetus and the offensive and they had all the, the position, the, 
material in place to go after him. He was taken out of the picture because it was an embarrassment. Marlo Hylett then, from 1996 until his death in 2006, uh, became the big guy. He became so big that he could no longer be ignored and the state went after him. They started taking a lot of drugs of him. They started arresting a lot of members of his gang. All these guys are paranoid, uh, very, very edgy. If you start losing quantities, large, large quantities by the ton of drugs, people that you get the drugs from have to be paid. There's no, there's no such thing as sale or return. There's no such thing as, well, we'll owe you that. You pay. And if you don't pay, you get killed. Uh, but also his own people started turning against him. And there was a, Kinahan was in the background. And one of his protégés in turn was a fellow called Eamon Dunn. We called him the Don. And they decided, Marlowe's going to have to go. Now, Marlowe was involved in the murder of Baiba Salute, a young Latvian mum yeah. who was shot dead. Uh, and her lawyer, who was also, ironically enough, my lawyer, uh, was trying to kill him as well, John Hennessy. And that was all happened in 2006. And then they decided, we're going to kill Marlowe because he's just a problem. And two of his most loyal lieutenants went in that day and shot him. And, of course, Anthony Campbell was fixing the radiator and they just decided case, corporate yeah. decision or decision, survival decision. He knows me. There was a guy called Johnny Mangan. And Mangan decided, well, he knows me from the north inner city. And he just as easy as I just shot. The kid put his hand up to stop him. Bullet went through there into his head and he died. Uh, and that was the start of a new era for that gang. And that was Eamon Dunn. Eamon Dunn lasted... Uh, four years. Eamon Dunn murdered 15 people in that period of time. And he himself was murdered. And it always reminds me, he used the line t by Thomas Hobbes, you know, the life of man, young men, a young man, a young man is nasty, brutish and short. And <coughs> I'm probably going to again blathering on too far from the original point, but the thing is that you don't last very long. There's a predictability about it. Yeah. In fact, there is such a predictability about it that Eamon Dunn ordered his own casket from the United States. Uh, he ordered his own grave, where he wanted to be buried head to head with another psychopath called Paddy Doyle. And Paddy Doyle was the guy who did, actually did the, the shooting that we were talking about earlier at Clontarf, yes. uh, which Duck Count happened in front of <laughs> the, the, the murder of Ger uh, Noel Roach, uh, which is another day's work, but another day's story. But he wanted to be buried head to head with him. He left instructions that there was to be no mobile phones allowed when he was laid out. He was to be laid out in a certain amount of clothes, a certain kind of clothes. All his henchmen were to wear black. They were to stand guard over his coffin. There was nobody to be allowed. They were to keep an eye on him because nobody could come in and deface him. This is what this guy was thinking. When he, this was six months before he was whacked. Um, and uh, what else did he do? Oh, yeah, he left, obviously, a, a bar bill uh, for the, in the Swiss cottage so all the guys could go on the piss afterwards when they buried him. And he'd also instructions where his coffin was to be carried and who was to carry it and all that kind of stuff. The point being that there's a predictability about all of this. He knew he was going to be killed. And... That's how it's, it, and it is a pre very precarious. So it's all very, as I say, predictable. You say these guys get up the ladder, they last only a short period of time. And, and that after 23, 24, 25 years of doing this kind of job, I nearly can map out for fellas. I can nearly tell you who's going to be killed, you know what I mean? So there's an awareness it's, it's of the mortality got, rate. It's not, it's not because you've got a crystal ball or something, yeah. because you've got some great link with somebody in another dimension. It's because... You've got a shelf life. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You, you've talked about Limerick and you've, you've talked about some of the communities in Dublin and their response to things like the heroin explosion and, and, and the rise of some of these, these figures and, and, and these groups, these gangs. Um, do you think community response to this level of crime is effective? Or do communities end up responding for a short period of time and then just rolling over and accepting it? I think communities respond for a short period of time. I think uh, people have to get on with their lives. Uh, it's not the job of ordinary men, women and children to police their society. It is important for them to be participate in the policing of their society in the sense that <coughs> maintain the laws and, and things like that. But uh, Particularly in Dublin, but I, I remember the old days uh, when, I, when I went to Dublin first, the late 80s, 87, 88, that was the time when Martin Cahill was making a nuisance of himself but, uh, and there was a lot of stuff going on. But around that time, people could be quite vociferous in local communities against local drug dealers and that. And if you look at old clips, we did a TV series this time last year, three-part, called Bad Fellas, the same name as the book, which was the, ground, was the forerunner to the book. Um, and you see all the people standing at the, the, the gates of uh, the forecourts attacking the van containing Larry Dunn, who's 
who he and his family were the people who brought heroin to Dublin in the autumn of 1979 and started the whole thing. Uh, and they were very vociferous in saying, you know, we would stand up to these guys. You wouldn't get anyone doing that now because people just won't do it because they're afraid. Because these guys come back in the middle of the night and shoot you. Um, as well as that, there was, was a very good organisation called the Concerned Parents Against Drugs, mm. which was very, very positive and laudable. Because, again, remember, they, all the, the, the heroin thing took off, and heroin became the, the symptom of the problem, uh, uh, the level of social dysfunction in that it only took heroin months to take hold in whole areas, because people didn't know anything about it, but also it was a new buzz. And it, I remember interviewing a, a junkie called um, Jem Dixon, who was one of the first drug runners in the 1980s. He, he took his first fix in 1980. I met him in 1994. One of his legs was gone. Two or three fingers with this hand were gone. He looked like he, he looked like he was dead. Yeah. <laughs> and he he was still taking the gear. And he said that he cha he was chasing that elusive buzz from the first time he ever took it. And I'm sure you've heard that as well. Yeah, they never catch it. But the thing about the concerned parents was with all these communities, what was the symptom of the problem was that the problem was that all these communities were depressed, they had low self-esteem. You know, there was the collective consciousness was, so we're not worth it. You know, the concerned parents was positive in that it gave them all something, a purpose, it gave them a sense of community, and I think it's very, very fundamentally important on mm. social cohesion. Uh, and they, it gave them a bit of a buzz, and people started to stand up for themselves, and they got confidence. But the problem was that the provisional IRA and Sinn Fein in, in inveigled their way into the whole thing and they manipulated them because remember people who are vulnerable are always going to be manipulated and exploited if it's not the, the drug dealer if it's not the bloody government if it's not the police on some in some situations if it's not you know other people with political agendas it's happened right through history look at nazi germany what happened there and what they did was and i've eyewitnesses to this and i've always been very particular about this the, the founding father of the concerned parents against drugs movement is a fellow called john noonan John Noonan was from Fingus. He ran, he was the first man to run for Sinn Féin in the European elections. He ran at the local elections. He ran, I think, might even run for the Dáil. But he was the main figurehead for Concerned Parents Against Drugs. And he and his cohorts, I used to be hearing anecdotally about the mess that was going on behind the scenes, but I didn't actually believe it for a good few years. To make a long story short, John Noonan recently was ordered to pay the criminal assets bureau 1.5 million euro. Why? Because he was using... Martin, Martin Marlow Highland, the biggest drug trafficker in the state at the time, to launder his money. Uh, and Marlow Highland was meeting this. And the point I've been making is that you had community response. If Concerned Parents Against Drugs was on its own, with just pure heart, and it died as a result of all of that, because these guys were just fed in their own nest. And yeah. people, people used to see, and, and in a way you can see, again, going back to the absolute hardship it is for people trying to rear their kids in Ballymun with all the pressures that are already there. And then you see somebody's got a bit of hope for you. You can fight back. And then you know Johnny up the road can sell as much heroin as he wants because he's paying for his backhanders. And your kids are still getting sucked into this kind of thing. And it's really that... Very you hard. get very cynical at this Yeah, point. very hard to know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy in that situation. I um, nominate a few of the bad guys, all right. But <laughs> you've been doing journalism for quite some time at this stage. Um, one of the things that I'm very interested in is how the media impacts on the way we think and view things. Mm. We've talked about systems of knowledge or systems of understanding becoming sort of quite powerful. Um, how do you think that the media has fed into or affected, first of all, the way the general public have looked at crime and criminality in Ireland and also the way the criminals have looked at themselves? What? The, that, that's a very good question, and the, there's several different parts to your question. One is that people always turn around and say, you know, you glamorise these guys. Um, well, if we glamorise these guys and made them, give them a sense of themselves, and you, there, there, is a, there, there is truth in what you say as well, and they do like it. Some of them like it. They like the not, notor notoriety of it, mm. uh, because it gives them power, fear. Remember, fear is stroke, respect. Sure. Uh, they say we glamorise them make them look fluffy and nice and well I often say to people why then did Martin Cahill and his people go to burn my house in 1992 um, why did uh, was my family when 
my my wife was pregnant with our second child, uh, we had 24-hour armed guards at the house purely because the record was going to be an, an imminent attack any day because of something I wrote about Martin Cattle. Uh, why did they put a bomb on my Why did they butcher Veronica Gearn? Why did they shoot her in the leg? Why did they shoot Martin O'Hagan, a colleague of mine, in Lorgan uh, in 2001, which everybody forgets about? Um, if they loved the notoriety, then they wouldn't give a shit. Why did they always reach for the lawyers? Probably a lot of time with looking for nominating bad guys. The legal profession. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, don't don't get me know, started on that one. But you know, <laughs> the, the, so why did it do those things? Because they don't like it. They don't like your light being shed on them. In terms of the media, how the, how it influences people. I've always lived by one basic principle. Okay, I earn a good living out of it. I didn't set out to earn a good living out of it. I was just working as a reporter. I got into it. I lo I, I actually got into it because I like. The whole business, I can't explain it. It's a bit of a buzz. You can slip into it. It's like <laughs> developing a drug habit, you know. So next thing, I'm a junkie down the line. I don't know how that how did that happen. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so I, went, I, I, I just gradually got into it. And then you got more and more into it. You got to know who the characters were and what they were. And people are fascinated by, by basically what I, because of what I said at the beginning. Mm. Um, but you can, I, people say as well, you exaggerate and hyperbolize. And I always love it. A particular gouger said that to you. I was doing a radio interview the other morning. I said, you know, how can you uh, exaggerate a group of people who are prepared to butcher and murder anybody, including their own close rel family relatives, uh, who will take a shotgun when they shoot a guy and shove it in the lower part of his body, practically between the cheeks of his backside, and fire two rounds of a sawn-off shotgun at point-blank range to absolutely cut him in half. Uh, why would you take a kid who's starting to sweat and a bit worried because he got mixed up in the wrong place and shoot him and bury him at like a dog in a half grave? Uh, why would you shoot your own first cousin 16 times in the face and head and <laughs> he survived with a machine gun because you don't want to give him five grand's worth of jewellery? Uh, and the point I make about all of that is that you can't exaggerate or hyperbolize who these people are, what they are. It's the same thing, like politics and economics are the big thing now, the big buzzwords and you know, the big buzz areas in, 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 in uh, media. You know, the people who are, like commentators, yeah, maybe commentators get a bad press or whatever, but you're telling people what's happening. It is not a lie. Like, remember what Brian Cowan tried to say, and this is going back to the media, and I defend the media for this. Brian Cowan was telling everybody in Ireland that everything was tickety-boo when the Troika guys were already in town booking their, their hotel rooms in downtown Dublin, you know? Because if you didn't, like they were saying, this is exaggerated, this is wrong, you're going to, and they went after Joe Duffy on a personal level, because Joe's a very good friend of mine, but Joe, people were talking about the fears about the banks and people were taking the money out of the banks. Uh, and they tried to attack and demonize him and said, there's no, 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 there's no bailouts, there's no, no nothing going on. It's the exact same thing in what we do. You can't hyperbolize the fact that uh, guys get electronic bugging or tracking devices, put it to a car, which turns out to be the wrong car, watch it and track it on a laptop, send a hit team of three guys in a car when this other car is on the move at 11 o'clock at night, which happened this time last year. These two young lads, these are the two young lads who were up in Fingless. They pulled yeah. up at a garage to get cigarettes. And the boys walked up and shot them, blew their heads off, you know, like, and, went, and methodically like, killed, them, killed them well, if you know what I mean. They made sure they were dead. They weren't getting back up time. again. You can't exaggerate any of that. Uh, so people say, how does that affect? If, if it scares people, if, it scares, if people get scared about it, then that's fine. I, it, you're just telling them, this is a dimension to your society, and this is what's going on. And these are the kind of people who live amongst us. You either don't, you, like, I, it, we're in a free capitalist society. People don't have to buy the paper you write for. They don't. And, but also the media thing is changing as well, which is a to different debate, but like, media is so fragmented now, yeah. know, social media and everything like that. The gangsters love social media. I bet they, they do. They all got Facebook accounts. They're great. Well, they're getting cute now, you know, and they do all these kind of, you know, it's a bit like a lot of white Dublin, Limerick and Cork fellas who all want to be black. You ever hear the way they talk? Yeah, man. They all, they all, they all try to, to gangster speak, you know. Um, how does it affect their view of themselves? The view of themselves is that they like to think, a lot of these people are chaotic individuals, so uh, 
they're, and they're also doing coke a lot of them and doing other drugs. So they're already assisting their chaos. Yeah. Um, and they would like to they like to see the image themselves maybe as hard men, and they like to be they do some of them like to be written about, but at the same time they shoot you as quick as they look at you for writing about them. Is it difficult for you to live under that threat? I mean, as you said, you've had a Garda accompaniment for a long time. Um, you, you, you've had bombs planted under your car. I mean, your, your family have lived mm. in threat. Has that been, un that must have been uncomfortable. But, uh, it was uncomfortable, yeah. You're certainly not exaggerating that one, Shane. But uh, no, it, 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 it's, it's a consequence of some of the things that happened. But these things happen, uh, we've had incidents. And you have to be very careful all the time. Like I was saying to you earlier, you know, I yeah. go down to my local pub in Rathfarnham and I, it's great. Yeah. I can actually go into the pub and not have to worry about who I'm going to bump into, you know. Um, and I can have a few pints and enjoy myself. Um, I, I, for a long time I didn't have that, but it, 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 on a, it's a personal thing. You, you, it's what I do. I don't, can't do anything else. Yeah. Like when the news of the world decided to implode by a bunch of another fucking criminals uh, mm. gang, uh, who are claiming to be legitimate people, and these are business people. What they were getting up to, and I lost, potentially lost my whole career and livelihood over that. Sure. And for those three months, made you think about it. And But what I realised is this is what I do. I don't do anything else. And I enjoy doing it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going back, to, I'm going to st study in the Masters in Criminology now. Yeah. Maybe because I'd like, to, I'd like the look of your job. This is great. <laughs> <amazing. laughs> Three o'clock in the afternoon with a load of I, wonderful, fresh-minded students. Do I you need know, to be getting nervous? Track, it's great. <laughs> I might get paid a little bit less, but that'd be very good. I want to be a lecturer, maybe. That's <laughs> or a mechanic, I don't know. How, how has, uh, I mean, having a family, I mean, was what was your wife's Oh, it was very easy to have a family, you know, you just, it's a birds and bees thing. You know? No, but what, <laughs> what, 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 well, the guards who used to mind us would say, you know, it's not the gouges you have to worry about, Paul, it's your missus. She, we're afraid of her, we've got guns, you know. <laughs> Formidable feminist. She was one of the first bra-burning ladies in Ireland. She, oh, really? She was actually, she was, as, as an interesting part, she was, she was one of the first female journalists in Ireland to advocate in a local newspaper in the 1970s. She's older than me, by the way. Uh -huh. um, they advocate uh, women's right to choice to abortion, the right to, to, you know, the right to decide what they want to do. Catholic Church actually went after her in a big, big way. Her mother's a country woman from where we're from in Leitrim. Yeah. And a priest arrived from some, the Gestapo or whatever it was, to intimidate her in 1977, 78. Um, so she, and she's from Leitrim like myself, so she's made of tougher sort of stuff. Um, and uh, so I suppose when we got involved in it first, it didn't, you were, we were into it. I was into it. A few years before some of the trouble started happening, yeah. And then when Veronica was murdered, that was a that was, that a major major caused a lot of problems in my home, yeah, a yeah. lot of problems, because it, it really, like Jake, <coughs> our son was only about he's 22 now, so he was only a kid at the time. So, but Irina, our daughter, was only she's only two or three, so she wouldn't have been oblivious to it. But there was genuinely yeah, there was a big concern. But at the same time, you were faced with this thing. Is it? Yeah. Like, why in a free society, why can't you do what you want to do? And uh, I know Veronica's mum really well, and I got to know her a year before she was murdered. She was warning me about the guys who set her up ultimately to murder her. And I had more, probably a bit more street wisdom than she had, because she was only there for a couple of years. She was only there two years, yeah. Veronica. And I was the first journalist, ironically enough, on the scene that day. But there really does, there's a term, you know, the, the mafia say, hey, it's not personal, it's business, you know. But for me, it became not business, but personal. Yeah, that was very personal for you, wasn't but, but, it? But it was, and, yeah. and, and like, it's very hard to explain it. It's, unless, unless you're in the, uh, in the situation yourself, it's very hard to understand it. But I, I actually pursued the story of Veronica's murder relentlessly in the Sunday world, and the Sunday world were brilliant. Obviously, I never, because me being, you don't think outside the box a lot of times, but it was making money for them as well. Of course. Yeah. And people were buying the newspaper, and that's the irony of it all, you know. You don't think about these things as your journalist because you wouldn't be interested in some seemly things like sales and things like that. <laughs> as long as the, the, your wages pop into the bank at whenever they're supposed to. But it, it, you know, it became an industry, and in a way as well, I, to be very cynical about it, I, uh, when Marty was shot dead, Marty worked with us in the Sunday World, and he, we're the only West, we're the only developed, so-called developed country in the Western world 
remember, the population of the island of Ireland will fit into a corner of Manhattan on an average busy day. We have lost two journalists have been shot dead because they asked too many questions in this so-called developed society. But one of the things about the newspaper business I discovered was the people, does it, it's a subliminal thing. They really don't, it, it, if you get killed, that's tough. But the business is the business. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The people behind the scenes pulling the strings, because I remember after Brannick was murdered, there was more, and I found this unseemly, and I found it sickening. And perhaps it was just the way it was. But there was more of a fuss made about Tony O'Reilly arriving for Veronica's removal that evening before her funeral on a Friday evening. I'll never forget it. And more of a fuss about Eamon fucking Dunphy, that arsehole who can't stay to his, to his team for more than an hour, whether he's changed his mind like the bloody wind, and all these other arseholes who had nothing to do with the business of what we were doing. There was more effort and worry about getting stretch limous limousines for them and to get them in at the right time so the right picture could be taken of them. I found that unseemly and I found it disgusting and I suppressed it and I said, right, okay, these people pay my wages, that's fine. But I just found that is another dimension to it. But it's the media again, isn't it? It's, it's the media. The media is yeah. a heartless machine. Mm. Uh, and when Marty was murdered, I used to say, Jesus, they can't let this happen again. And then two years later, there was a, a, a hoax bomb in my house, but I was told I was going to be killed that year. And they were going to shoot me uh, because it was reliable information. It was going on for months. Uh, and it suited the Sunday world that they had had an interaction with the police because they could say, sh print the letters the Sunday after the bomb attack uh, saying that we told you this was going to happen and you, the state, have done nothing about it. But, um, it's a cynical old business, but like, uh, I don't look too much at that. I prefer just... The public are my people. Mm. So the people I write for, the people who buy the books and want to read my books, the people who want to read what I write about, the rest of them who don't, don't want to read it, don't want to know about it, that, that doesn't matter to me. I respect them. And I will tell them the story as best I can. The, you mentioned earlier sort of that gulf between the kind of scangers in tracksuits with the bling and the shaved heads and the tattoos, you know, your stereotypical limerick thug and your man wearing a shirt and tie working in a bank but more or less getting up to the same thing mm. just using very very different methods how do you think the reality that the bankers and the politicians are in some way engaged in just as effective kinds of crime how's that affecting the the mentality of people growing up in ireland today well uh, the, you know the moral the from a moral perspective, it's telling people that nobody is straight. There's no honesty. There's no morality. It's just do whatever you want to do yourself. Mm. And uh, it doesn't matter. The Gordon Geckos of this world, it doesn't matter just as long as you go and get it. And it sends a very bad mes message. That's why I'm saying it validates the behavior of a lot of these other guys. We did a survey last October, a Red Sea poll, where we asked a number of questions about um, bankers. And it was quite an intelligent poll, if I say so myself, um, <laughs> which is unusual, most of them aren't, but yeah. Because we asked a, a, a quite deep question. I'm trying to remember what the war, but, <laughs> but one of them was basically that the, the general public, something like 78% of the respondents said that, you know, they can see how uh, Shawnee Fitzpatrick and all these guys were every bit as culpable and as wrong and in the same moral category as the Christy Kennehans, or the Marlow Highlands, or the Eamon Dunns, or the Martin Cattles. Uh, I think when a society, when that becomes to a degree rudderless, when the people you're in, and that's what's wrong with the people here, we're at the anomic stage, I think, now at this stage in our, yeah. in our history. Um, when society feels, you know, that they, uh, for a long time, and maybe we have a new government now, and perhaps People, people want to be led, people want to have security, people want to have uh, mental security, psychological security. Um, when you look at that and you say, well, the people running the show, the fella at the tiller or the rudder is messing around as well. How can you expect the guy in the engine room to be doing his job, you know? And I think, that had a, I think that's had a very, I think it'll take years for that to wear off, but I think it has had a profound effect on the whole 
system of knowledge. And look, the way the doll has changed, the whole structure of the doll has changed. Yeah. Uh, uh, people are very disillusioned. Mm. Uh, and they want change, but you know, in democracy, I don't think you get much change here. Poor old Barack Obama, I don't think he's going to change with poor old Barack Obama. So he's going to lose his job maybe in another year or something. Looks that way. Change, Looks change, way. change, change. They, they don't. They can't really affect change a lot. Yeah. Of them. But what you can do is you can. Like, I, I know I'm talking a lot of shite here, maybe going off on a tangent. But the thing is that the um, I think they have had a very negative effect on the whole psychology of the nation. People have to have norms, people have to have people they can look up to and respect and say that they're doing the thing right, we can trust them, otherwise the whole thing falls apart. You mentioned what happened with News of the World and I know when I talked to you over the summer when everything was in its thick you were pretty pissed off about the whole, the whole thing. If I had a 9mm Glock automatic I would have known for find a few homes for the Browns in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Could you maybe just very briefly just explain exactly what did happen, how that whole thing? Well, I, I, I think I, our, our, our journalism and media students, mm. I think it's it's an interesting case in point. Well, I think it's going to be a PhD subject for journalism students in the future. Um, what happened? What happened? To tell you the truth, I still don't know what happened yet. 